Good morning, good morning, welcome, welcome back. And let's get started in, uh, I titled this Paul Visits Jerusalem and Departs to Tarsus, which is really the beginning. And then we shift back to Peter, uh, and we'll be with Peter for the next couple of chapters. Uh, this could be when Paul, uh, Paul, uh, you know, we, we talked about him being in Arabia yesterday. And it seems that uh, he's not well received when he gets to Jerusalem. So they, uh, as we're going to see here, they basically, uh, uh, at least some of them acknowledge that Paul is different. But because of some others who are, uh, are going to be persecuting the church because of Paul, it seems like they, uh, they have him depart and to stay out of the area. Uh, uh, so he heads back to Tarsus. And then we'll notice in a couple of chapters that, uh, that Paul starts his uh, journeys mostly up into you know, uh, Asia Minor, which basically would be Turkey and Greece and Rome and all the journeys that we hear about him. Uh, so we'll kind of, we'll, we'll tackle those as we, as we go along. But uh, so the Paul portion of this is just the first few minutes. And then we'll be talking about Peter. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity uh, to glean something new and, and uh, helpful in, uh, in your word that we can take and uh, use in our own lives. And we thank you and praise you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes, and particularly uh, the second story with Peter. I think it speaks volumes to something that a lot of people uh, still to this day don't really see, I think, how important that every person that's in the church structure uh, is important, to, not only to the church itself, uh, but to Jesus Christ and his ministry and, to, and the basic church function. Uh, so uh, let's get some verses in here. And since we're going to be talking about the early church, I got a map up uh, that uh, we can share some things as we go along. So now that Paul was converted and had been trained in Arabia, which, which, which we talked about yes, yesterday, we left out there with Galatians 1.17, uh, neither went I up to Jerusalem, to which... Uh, at that point, them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again under Damascus. So we left off there. So Paul at this point made his way, to, way now. He's going to face the apostles. And based on what he was before, they were a bit apprehensive. So that's where, that's where our story picks up here. Uh, in Acts 9.26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Uh, so was he, uh, you know, was, was, he, was he playing this game to get on their good favor and then he was going to have them all arrested? So we'll pick it up here and see how Barabbas, uh, Barnabas, I mean, uh, that we, uh, uh, it actually gets relayed to us better when we get to uh Acts 11, 22 through 26. We will see again up in Antioch. We'll vouch for him as he seems to be well trusted by those in Jerusalem. I seem to have some verses out of place here. Let me go by my notes. Uh, so I'm going to jump to Acts 11, 22 just to talk a little bit about uh, Barnabas and find out who this gentleman is. Then tidings of, the, uh, of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarshish for to seek Saul. So that's the next time we're going to see Barnabas. Uh, and it'll be, also be the next time we see uh, Saul or Paul. Okay, so back to our text. Uh, picking up here in Acts 9, verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Now this is uh, him being uh, Paul. And declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and now he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. 
And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the, great, uh, the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. And that's going to be what it seems to be why they decide that this ain't the right time for Paul to be in Jerusalem. Because there seems to be some kind of a, uh, a dispute with the Grecians. And I'm going to talk about the Grecians here for a second. Let me finish the passage here to verse 30. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarshish. Uh, so what are these Grecians? Or, 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 they're also known as Hellenists. We met them back in chapter 6, verse 1. And they were complaining about the uh, the treatment of the uh, widows. I'll just refresh our memory here. I'll read the verse, verse 6, 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay, who are these Grecians? Or Grecians are the Greek-speaking Jews uh, or Greek Hellenists who were swayed to be more Greek in their ways were, then the Jews of Jerusalem were more tied to the Mosaic law, kind of like city dwellers who meet country folks, I guess you could almost say. So it seems here they did not like Paul, probably left over spite from when he was per persecuting the Jews, or the, the Christians, persecuting the church. So it seems time for Paul to head north and also... <coughs> He goes back to his hometown until things blow over locally. Uh, he, will he will be back to visit on occasion, but his primary ministry, as we remember that Jesus himself said, was to the Gentiles anyways. And we saw that in Acts 9.15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. But mostly the children of Israel, not in Jerusalem. Later on, when we get in Acts, you're going to see a, a, uh, a conference where the, all the apostles come together, both Paul and the other 12. And they decide that it's best that uh, the 12 apostles, originals, will, will concentrate uh, in the area of Israel, and Paul will concentrate in the area uh, north up there in uh, Turkey and those places. This is also confirmed also in Galatians 1, 20 through 24. Let me read through that. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. This is Paul speaking. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Sicily. You might, might go to our map here just for a sec second. When he says Sicily is up, Syria is up in this area. See Syria. And Sicily is in this area. So this is, uh, this is outside the area that uh, would be typically uh, be the area that uh, the, down in Jerusalem is where the disciples basically uh, worked. Verse 22 of Galatians 1. And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So he wasn't spending his time down in Judea. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. So it was getting around that Paul had, had converted. And they glorified God in me. So that he was having more success uh, up in that area than he was down in Jerusalem. So for now, until Barnabas seeks him again in chapter 11, we return to Peter and his ministry in Jerusalem and surrounding area. So basically that uh, what they did is in, uh, as I mentioned there in verse 30, let me just look at that again. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea. So here's Caesarea right here. Let me blow that up a little bit. Caesarea was a seaport. So most likely they put him on a ship rather than have him try to go by land all the way. And they sent him up to uh, up to Tarsus. And Tarsus is where Paul was from. It's up here in Sicilia. So that, uh, and he seems to spend his time there working in that area until Barnabas comes again from Antioch to uh, to get him to bring him back to Antioch uh, for and this we'll see this when we get to chapter 11 so I kind of wanted to give you an idea of what was going on here so back to verse 31 then had the churches rested throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified 
and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So this seemed to calm everything down for the moment. And now that uh, the, the disciples can get back to the work that God had given them, that like Jesus had given them. So that's where we'll pick it up here. So we shift back to Peter. I might mention just a few things here on fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is not something to fear per se. It just means that uh, that you realize, that you understand that uh, the Lord uh, has our best interest at heart, I think. Some verses on that in Psalm 34, 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. So it's a good thing. It's also in Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reference and godly fear. And also talking about comfort, uh, comfort of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's mentioned there also. John 14, 6. Here Jesus is talking about that. And I will pray the Father that he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That's the Holy, Holy Ghost. And Paul in Philippians 2, 1 and 2 mentions it also. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So whatever we are put through is such a great feeling he is always with us, that no matter what, uh, whatever we're dealing with, that he's there with us. <clears throat> one of my favorite poems, again, is uh, Footsteps in the Sand. Uh, it describes a picture of uh, two sets of footsteps walking through walking through life. And it talks about the fact that Jesus Christ is beside us, walking with us always. Then all of a sudden, one footstep disappears, and the man is concerned uh, that, uh, that it seemed like Jesus had left. And then Jesus turns around and says, Son, I didn't leave. The footsteps are mine because I'm carrying you. And I think it's a beautiful picture of how the Lord is always there with us, no matter what we're going through. And if necessary, will carry us. Okay, so, so let's get on to Peter. Yeah, I'm going to bring up a different map. Okay, so the journeys of Peter. And uh, so, again, he's centered in Jerusalem. And he, uh, I don't know why, uh, well, let's pick this up in verse 32, and we'll talk about uh, this first uh, this first miracle he performs. Verses 32 through 35, and then we'll talk about it. It came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt in Lydia. So you can see about where Lydia is from Jerusalem. Oh, probably uh, oh, 20 miles, maybe. Maybe a full day's walk. And there he found a certain man named Ananias, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. Sounds like, uh, sounds exactly like uh, when John and Paul, I mean Peter, uh, their first miracle there on the steps of the uh, golden uh, gate. And Peter said unto him, Ananias, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Oh, we'll stop there for a second. So Peter, through the power of Jesus Christ, heals a man, just like in Acts 3, 6. And that was what we were just talking about. Because then Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Remember that was at the golden gate there in the temple. And that got 3,000 people saved. So, which continues to show the early believers that Jesus is real. Remember, there's no Bible yet. Uh, there's uh, no, uh, this is a brand new situation, brand new uh, uh, thing that we're dealing with when it comes to Jesus Christ, foretold in the Old Testament, but not fully understood by everyone. So that uh, we're in a period of time where there's no New Testament yet to help us understand it. So you have Peter uh, saves this person and it helps to save uh, many around there. So continuing on, because about the same time that he's in, he's in Lydia, some people in Joppa hear about the fact that he's in Lydia. And they have a death that they're, and this is the story I wanted to uh, spend a little time on today. 
uh, because I think it's a beautiful picture of uh, of people that are well loved within the church and the the family around uh, each member of a church body, particularly a local church, you know, like you would have at your at your lo own local congregation. This is the kind of stuff that you don't get if you're out and about. Uh, or if you're watching church on TV, you don't get to know the people really. Uh, you hear good preaching, and I, I enjoy doing that too. Uh, but uh, you still need a local church, and you need to know people and, and interact with others, have people to that have your back, that kind of thing. So pick it up here in verse 36. Now there was a, a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha. Let me get this map a little bigger. You can see what I'm talking about. So we went from Jerusalem up to Lydia, and now and now we're talking in Joppa. Joppa, we're going to talk about next. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Now this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. You ever, ever met one of those people in your local church? You know, the one that brings something to eat almost every uh, uh, every service or always there to do the little things you need each and every day. You know, maybe uh, the one that uh, is available to babysit your kid on a moment's notice or uh, the grandma type that uh, yeah, can really relate to your kids. Or read books or maybe even uh, have a, a Sunday school class, things like that. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, in this story, she's going to pass away. So that's the, the, the crux of it. And it came to pass in... It came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in the upper chamber. And for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And then Peter arose and went with them when he was come. They brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. So uh, they're showing off all these beautiful things. This beautiful woman helped out the local church. <clears throat> but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and the widows, presented her alive. <clears throat> and it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. So, through the, th through the raising from the dead, a very devout and loved woman, uh, kind of like what Dr. McGee says when I was reading his commentary on this passage, we can take a great lesson from this story. This woman was engaged in social service. She had the gift of sewing. Do you mean to tell me that sewing is a gift of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it is. It was for this woman. Many people today are seeking for some exciting, flashy gift, such as speaking in tongues or being a preacher or so on. May I suggest seeking a gift that is practical? I say very carefully and kindly, dear sister, learn to sew. Sewing was a gift of Dorcas. I doubt that she ever spoke at a missionary conference meeting or taught a woman's Bible class. I don't think she ever had the, uh, an opportunity because she was one of the early saints. But she did a lot of wonderful things for people, for folks. We all contribute in some way that the Holy Spirit lays upon us. And we should never say, I only did this or I only did that. From the person who in love does their part each week to help the church. It's all a blessing when it was what the Lord had asked them to do. So I think that's an important lesson here uh, that uh, uh, we all can take to heart. So let's take a look at a few things in this particular story. Uh, going back to verse 36. <clears throat> now there was a job for a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Doricus. Uh, this woman was full of good works and alms deed, which she did. Full of good works. Uh, Paul mentions uh, something about this in 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefulness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. 
but which becoming women professing godliness with good works. Uh, so that's a uh, it's an attribute that Paul even recognizes that the the, the women who uh, who show themselves to be modest and of good works and uh, and in their error and present themselves in a uh, in a modest way, like Tabitha here. Uh, and also in verse 40, but Peter put, uh, put them all forth and kneeling down and prayed and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. Tabitha, arise. I, I think this is rather interesting. Almost the exact same term that Jesus used when he was outside a certain tomb. Lazarus, arise. In Matthew 9, 25. And when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand and the maiden rose. Oh, no, no, that different time, sorry. Uh, this is the time that uh, Jesus went to that uh, young girl and, uh, and had her come back from the dead. I was thinking of uh, but she, but he also said arise also. <laughs> and also verse 41, and talking about uh, presented her alive, uh, uh, we serve a living Savior, and I like that uh, that aspect uh, that uh, He presented her alive, and in doing that, He also presented that Jesus Christ is alive. Uh, that's the parallel pattern here, uh, and we see that in Acts seventeen three, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and rise again from the dead, and that does this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Christ means Messiah. That's uh, we even Job knew what happened someday. I, I somehow skipped over this verse a few times. I think Job 19, 25 through 27. Even Job, way back before Abraham, or about the time as Abraham, they figured Job was uh, written. Uh -uh. But before uh, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So they figured Job was the first book written uh, that's actually in the canon. So even Job believed that someday a redeemer would live. For I know that my redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, and my flesh shall I see God. This is Job speaking. Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold. And not another, though my reins be consumed within me. But come some day, and we also, as, a, as Paul reminds us, are in same, that same category. Uh, looking at 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Uh, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall ri be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We also will, if not before, rise again during the rapture. All oh, looking forward to that so much. I think it's so close. I don't know if it'll happen before I die, but... I just think it's uh, it's getting, of course, it's cl getting closer every day, of course. Uh, but uh, how far away it is, hard to say. But it just seems like there's a lot of world events that are, are coming about that, uh, boy, I even going within my own lifetime back into my teens and early 20s when I first was studying this, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> that uh, even though I studied it, I didn't feel it. I didn't, it didn't seem like it was uh, really close. And that was back in the 70s, early 80s. But now I just, I just got a feeling that it's so close. And maybe I'll see it before I, I die. But who knows? It could be another 50 years. It could be 100 years. Who knows? I could be just uh, just looking forward to that day uh, so much and looking forward to seeing my Savior. Can't wait. And speaking of, Paul, was, Paul felt the same way. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The classic rapture passage. <laughs> But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Asleep being uh, passed away, uh, Christian sleep is de uh, Christian death is different than anyone else's because it's not death really it's a passing from this world into a heavenly world. Uh, continuing in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. Oh, looking for that day so much. Okay, a couple of the verses to look at. Verse 42. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Praise God. This, this helped to also show many of who Jesus was uh, by, by showing the very thing that, that Jesus himself was able to do. Uh, we see in John 11, 45. And many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. Amen. And also chapter John 12, 9 through 11. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. <clears throat> it, uh, it spread pretty quickly that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. <laughs> they, didn't want, they didn't want any evidence of this. So they kind of blew their whole theory. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. <clears throat> so, one more verse to look at. Verse 43. So, it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. This is what we're going to pick up to... Uh, next week on this one uh, so he's in joppa and uh and it talks about this guy known as simon a tanner so peter's going to stay here for a while and his ministry is just starting as we will see next week when a roman centurion will through the holy spirit receive a visit from peter and peter learns a valuable lesson here about who are worthy simon the tanner who lives by the sea uh, which is mentioned in acts 10 6 he lodges with one San Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou ought to do. It's an interesting place for Peter to learn this, this lesson. Tanners weren't well much liked. Uh, as we read in the IVP Bible background, I kind of like this because it talks about what life was like during certain times in the Bible. And actually, believe it or not, they believe that they know what this man's shop was known as uh, Simon the Tanner. This is what his shop looked like. That doorway is supposedly the door into his shop. Uh, and Tanner's basically, uh, by the, by, we're not really, uh, well, I'm going to read it here in a second. This is what it says in that IVP Bible background. It was customary to name people by their occupation or their parentage. Strict, strict uh, observers of uh, Pharisaic opinions avoided tanners whenever possible because their stripping of animal hides continually involved them with unclean carcasses. Second century teachers reported, not necessarily accurate, that tanners had been forbidden in Jerusalem. Many rabbis were more lenient if the tannery were not near, was, were near water as Simon's house is. <laughs> but Judaism stressed hospitality and Peter who probably never followed the, the Pharisees very much anyways, opinions anyway, is happy to receive it. So he went to live with this man known as Simon the Tanner. In this particular uh, place, this is the uh, artist's rendition of what it may have looked like back in that time frame uh, in the, uh, in the uh, art form of uh, tanning hides, animal skins, basically what we call leather today. And it was a pretty nasty job, too. And it says here in this diagram, a Mohammedan sanctuary on the south side of the court of the house, there is an arched recess in which a lamp is always burning and where pilgrims perform their devotions. A well of good water and a fine fig tree add to the uh, attractions of this place. Uh, so the traditional house of Simon the Tanner. Uh, and they called it tanning, believe it or not, because... Uh, the material used in tanning uh, came from a uh, bush or a tree or something uh, that was called a tan a tanner tree. It was like the bark off of that tree is where they got the chemical to actually do the tanning. Uh, so, but you realize that uh, you know we we went through Joshua and uh, before that all the rules about uh, coming in contact with dead bodies, and so you can see why the Pharisees would have had a problem 
uh, with this particular occupation uh, because they would be in contact with dead bodies all the time of animals. Uh, so that was something that uh, to be avoided by the uh, by a Jew because they would make him unclean uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, okay, so that was my lesson for today. And, uh, and we are done for this week. And so we will uh, hope you all have a great weekend. And uh, if you happen to be in the Florence area, I welcome you to come to the church uh, where I go. And that's Fairhaven Baptist Church in Florence. And uh, it's on Highway 287. And so I hope if you're in the area, you want to stop by. I'd love to see you. And, uh, and I'll see you again on Monday when we get back into uh, Joshua. So we'll see you then. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And, and help all those listening and, uh, and all our family and friends that they have a safe weekend and that all things are, uh, all, all their needs are, are met when it comes to essentials and that they have a, a good weekend and they, uh, that they remember you in their prayers and that uh, uh, all people listening will also have uh, a, joyous, a joyous day and weekend. And we'll see you and thank you, Lord, so much for all you provide for us each and every day. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, so you guys have a great weekend and we'll see you Monday.